Welcome to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Every week, I'll be sitting down with a sales executive where they'll share their stories and experiences that produce game-changing results. Let's be honest, sales can be a tough game. I'm sure at some point, we've all delivered a less than stellar demo, been ghosted by a client or two, and sometimes, maybe we did more talking than listening. And that's where I can help. The stories and insights our guests share can be applied to your own business, your territory, or with your team, so you're not reinventing the wheel. Our weekly tactics and strategies help you get out of your head and start creating your own path towards game-changing results. Welcome back to the K2 Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Kelly. Now, I had the chance to sit down with this year's recipient of the IT World Canada's top woman in cybersecurity, Amanda Vincenzo. And what a treat it was. And when you think about cybersecurity, you, you might think, you know, engineering, mail, um, tech space, even the language is very heavy. And, and Amanda couldn't be further from any of that. And, and this is the beauty of it. it. She dispelled many myths about the space itself. And she just shared so much authenticity about who she is as a person that a lot of people, I would say, you know, that are, are looking into this space and, and perhaps, you know, going another route might reconsider based on what she shared. Um, she, and unfortunately, you know, less than 25% of women make up the cybersecurity space, which there's so much room for growth. And what Amanda does, you know, on the side and she mentors and she helps others and she shows you know, you don't have to have a tech background, that women can be at the seat, that we need a seat at the table. And so she just did a fabulous job of looking at cybersecurity and, and tech from a different lens. And one thing she brought about was just, you know, her as a person, she she prides herself on on having purpose, on being you know, very intentional and, and really the desire to help. And when you pair that with cybersecurity, you, you might not see the correlation, you know, but she says people are being violated, they're being attacked, and I want to help them. And so when you can come at it from that lens, it opens doors, it invites you to think about it differently. But, you know, when you look at, you know, being the only woman in the room, not having a technical background, um, you know, not really fully understanding the scope and what, what cybersecurity is, it's easy to take a different path. But she didn't do that. She leaned into it. She leaned into discomfort in a lot of areas initially where she struggled, whether it would be the only woman in the room, whether it be to, you know, submit her first draft of a proposal, whether it be to speak up and ask these questions without second guessing herself. So things that we all face, and, you know, she is recognized as this huge achievement, she too faces. And, you know, the beauty is now when she can lean into her vulnerability and share her stories, share her journey with her team, she becomes relatable, she becomes approachable, and all of a sudden her team are leaning in and they're trying it and they're telling their friends. And this is the kind of leader we need to really invite more women, more diverse audience to come into the space of cybersecurity. So, you know, tremendous eye-opening conversation here. Uh, encourage, you know, encourage you to listen to it if you're in the tech space, if you're considering it, or you know somebody who is. And one statement she coined was uh, brave, not perfect. And, you know, that just resonated me, who she is as a person, and also what she brings to the, the cyberspace community, her role as a leader, and her team. And it's just, you know, in the moment, it's tough. And I struggle, whether you get in your head, whether you're doubting yourself, whether you have imposter syndrome. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be brave. And in over time, this bravery is becoming easier and easier. And perfection's off the table because it's just the sure way to let you down. So she's always, you know, striving for progress. And it's beautiful that she does that because these are the kind of people that are that she's that she's molding. Uh, when she's mentoring, this is the message that you know she's she's sharing with younger women to invite them into the cybersecurity space. So she's dispelling the myths the rumors, and she's really educating them and creating awareness as to what it really is and how you can have a thriving career and how you can win these prestigious awards just like men. So invite you to listen. I thoroughly enjoyed it, learned a lot myself. And as I mentioned, if you know anybody, please feel free to share it. Also, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, I encourage you to do that. And we'd also, we're always looking to improve ourselves. So we would value a, uh, a feedback or review um, to let us know how we're doing and again, increase our reach so we can have more people like Amanda on the podcast. So thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.
So I am delighted to be speaking with IT World Canada's top woman in security recipient of 2022, Amanda Vincenzo. So first of all, Amanda, congratulations. That's a huge accomplishment and welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm so excited to be here um, and, and talking about cybersecurity and women in the field. Um, I'm so thankful that you've invited me here to have this wonderful conversation with you. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think, you know, there's no better person to have it than the recipient of this this, this highly um, recognized award. But before we get into the award, I just kind of want to take us back a little bit. And, you know, obviously, you know, you've spent more than 15 years in cybersecurity. So what, what even got you intrigued to enter that world in the first place? Uh, yeah, wonderful question. It, you know, it was, a lot of it was by accident, to be quite honest. I had, um, it, it's funny having the conversation with my mom not too long ago. She had uh, reminded me that uh, take your kids to work day way back when uh, I was a grade nine. I went to work with her and I left. Uh, we went to Scotia McLeod. She was working at Scotia McLeod in Toronto and we left there that day. And I was like, I don't want to work in IT. I don't want to work in tech when I grow up. And funny enough, here I am working in tech as a woman in cybersecurity. And so it happened almost by accident. I'll be quite honest. I had applied to school, post-secondary education. I was um, not um, sure that that was the direction that I wanted to go into. Um, I had applied into social work. And I was just having those moments of, I'm not sure what I want to get into. And so what I decided to do was just take some time off and really just start to work. And that landed me actually in the world of IT. And I started just as, um, you know, just something I wanted to do so that I was getting my feet wet into different areas. And um, so I ended up there in a very entry level position. And afterwards, I, I really realized that I actually did enjoy what I was doing there. And I was able to move um, through different um, groups within the organization. And then I landed into a, a project management group that was working on firewalls. And that was my introduction to cybersecurity. And just the words firewalls and 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 learning about them and what they were doing and um, really brought to my attention that this whole industry that I wasn't really aware of that was really starting to gain popularity at the time. Um, so it, it happened completely by accident. I started to work on implementations for firewalls and I started to realize that I was doing something that was meaningful and, and purposeful and something that I um, had a passion about. Here we were um, putting in technology in place to help protect companies, help protect companies, protect their people and their information at the end. Um, you know, there, there are um, different threats across um, the world. And one of them is definitely um, threat actors that are trying to take information away from companies. And um, at the end of the day, a lot of that information is people. It's, it's people's personal health information. So I quickly started to realize that this world of tech, not only was it, you know, interesting um, and relevant, but I felt as though we were doing something right. We're doing the right thing and we're really helping people at the end of the day. And so, so it, you know, it was a long journey and um, I decided to actually continue um, with cybersecurity and I've spent um, my, my, most of my career in this field. I can't really imagine changing my field because I just, it's something that I really enjoy and I feel passionate about. It's a great story. And um, I'm sure your mom secretly is proud knowing that she, <laughs> she swayed you a little bit at the beginning. Absolutely. We definitely joke about that. So, but, but think about, you know, in those early days, you were unaware of what IT was. And after a little bit of digging, how many other people do you think from the outside looking in are also unaware of, you know, we've all heard of the word firewalls, but like beyond that. So how many people do you think would identify with what you thought way back in those early days? Oh, I think so many. And I've met so many young women and, and so many people, friends of mine even, um, who say to me, oh my goodness, you work in tech, you work in technology, firewalls, they're intimidated by those words. 
And a lot of people, I feel, think that you need to be technical. You need to be an engineer in order to get into IT. And I'm here to tell you that that's actually not the case. There are so many different roles within technology, within IT, within cybersecurity, that you actually don't need to be the technical person there. Um, and it took me a while to realize the importance of non-technical um, people within the industry as well, like myself, you know, walking into a boardroom, I, and I won't forget this, I was in many boardrooms where there were, you know, 17 males and there was myself there and I, I couldn't help but feel intimidated. And when I looked around, you know, a lot of them were engineers and a lot of them were working on, you know, the network designs and all that. And it took a moment of me to stop and think and realize um, I'm just as important. I'm just, I, I need to be here just like everybody else does because I bring a skill to the table that they don't have. You know, they may have the skills of the engineering skills, um, but I also have skills that they don't have. And so coming together, really getting everybody's um, skills and bringing them to the tables, how we're going to make progress in this field and how we're going to continue to do really great things. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And I would say a lot of people, you know, walking into that room of 17 men would also feel a being the only woman, but also, you know, they're, they're not tech, they, they don't have those techs. So what, where do you think that came from, Amanda, where you had that feeling that said, I too belong here and we, you know, collectively can come together, collaborate, and that's what's going to be, you know, the the greater good. Where, where did that come from? Because I would say most people would kind of put their head down and go, oh man, this is tough. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, it, it didn't come quickly. It And it came from um, me really digging deep um, and having a lot of conversations with people. So I will say probably the first 20 times I walked into that room, I felt incredibly intimidated and I didn't have that feeling. And I think I, I spoke about it with a lot of people. I've been really, really lucky in my career and in my life to have a wonderful mentors and mentorships. And I started to talk about some of my insecurities, right? And so this is where I started to bring my vulnerability to the table. And I started to realize, what are my, what are my vulnerabilities here? Why, why, what's making me feel this way? And really just speaking with other people, um, other mentors of mine was really when they started to tell me, you do belong at the table here, right? Uh, you bring skills that they don't have. So I, I don't know that it's necessarily something that I found or realized on my own, but it's, I think my, my grit and my determination kept me there. Mm -hmm. And then it was really getting into the vulnerability, like what, why do I feel this way? and really starting to talk about it with people. Um, I, I talk often about imposter syndrome, and it's something that I've struggled from uh, quite a bit. And one of the things I've learned is talking about it is wonderful. And you'll actually realize there are a lot of people who suffer from imposter syndrome and a lot of people who um, often can get a little bit nervous in those situations. But it's being able to talk about it and and really get different perspectives. And, it, and that's really when I started to um, have those vulnerable conversations with my colleagues and them saying to me, you know, you, you, you deserve to bring, uh, to be here at the table. This is what you bring. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it was such an important lesson. And it's something that I continue to remind myself um, that every table that I'm at, I'm, I'm bringing something to this table. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. I love that. And, and think about vulnerability. I mean, it's, it's a strong word, but a lot of people see it as weakness, you know, to be vulnerable, to show my emotions. But had you not, you know, been vulnerable, which invited you to look inward and say, I, I you know, I need to be here and I, I'm struggling right now. But then you, you, you invited other people, like you share that with other people, you're bringing them in. And that's basically asking for help because you, you, you wanted a different outcome. And, and I can see, you know, that, this is so good that you've done it, but I can see where other people would probably um, struggle to start or along those way when it gets uncomfortable, we stop because we go back to what's safe and what we know. But you you forged ahead and even perhaps in those beginning stages when you couldn't see 
what others saw in you, it took them to say, Amanda, you belong here. You know, your strengths are recognized. And that was the catalyst or that, you know, lit what you needed to be lit. And then you took it, you're like, I got this. But sometimes we need that external help to get that in internal motivation or drive. And that's where your grit and determination came. But it sounds like, you know, without that mentorship and, and for you basically asking for feedback and guidance, you might not be where you were today. Absolutely. Absolutely. I cannot tell you how important mentorship has been to me in my career. I've, um, I've been so lucky that I've been able to find people that I can be vulnerable with. Because again, I don't know that that's something that you can have that level of connection with somebody, but I've been so lucky in having that. And that's something that I try and really continue and bring to the table. I'm a huge believer of uh, bringing women into this field of technology. I, I want to be a trailblazer. I am all for it. And I love to share stories with women and teach them these things such as, you know, you don't need to be technical to get into the field. Um, so I love to do um, mentorship and, and I work with a lot of mentees and just be, like you said, that voice of reason because I see so many women, uh, young women who are trying to enter this field and they may have the same, um, maybe not the exact same, but they have those level of insecurities of, you know, when they're, they're going to walk into their first boardroom and they're going to see 17 men and just themselves and how, how can they overcome it? Right. So anything that I can do to share and to give back to young uh, women trying to get into the field, I, I absolutely love to do that. And I want to be that reminder for those young women that you can, you deserve to be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's amazing. And when do you, do you get a signal? Like when you're doing this, is there, you know, it's, it's, I'm hearing the law of reciprocity here, but do you see something that you're like, yes, they're doing it. They're getting it. Like my, you know, you're starting it, but they're doing it. Do you see things like that, that like progress signals, cues? And it's so rewarding. Um, and I, I continue to tell them, it, and it doesn't matter where, at what stage you are in your career, right? When you start doing something that's out of your comfort zone, it's scary and it's hard and it's all that. But to be able to just continue to put that one foot in front of the other and really break out of that comfort zone, I really feel as though, um, and, and, and maybe that's, you know, raising your voice in that room of 17 people, um, whatever it may be. Um, but if you can just continue to push through, the magic really will be at the other end of that. So. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And, you know, I think as a leader, you know, our job is to be relatable to our team so that they can see that that, that then makes us approachable. But when you're sharing your vulnerabilities and you're saying, I was there too, you know, all of a sudden they're like, she's normal. She makes mistakes. She, she you know, had imposter syndrome. And so they're more, in, they're more apt to follow and to listen to what you have to say. Yeah. You know, I had one of those moments, even just this year, I went to a women in cybersecurity conference and there was this woman CISO um, and she was the MC of the day. And she was phenomenal. She was a wonderful speaker. I enjoyed um, the entire day. And at the end of the day, I had gone up to her and introduced myself to her. And I'll be honest, even that is me just pushing myself out of my comfort zone. I am very naturally a shy person and an introvert, but I wanted to go and have a conversation and let her know that I enjoyed um, learning from her and listening to her that day. And she came off the stage and told me that she was so nervous being there. And I thought, you know, it, it's it's still this reminder that we are all still in the same boat. And she's sea level um, and she's doing a phenomenal job. She's got an audience full of people who are all looking at her, learning from her um, and happy to see that. And here she is getting off the stage and she's also nervous, right? So I think, you know, the more that we can share that with others, I think um, we'll realize that it's okay to be nervous. We're all in the same boat, but we need to keep going. You just need to keep on going and we need to be there. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and I think what you are to them, to your team, you know, you have people like her, which is a reminder for you that sometimes, yeah, we, I think at the end of the day, we're human. 
And so if we didn't have emotions, we, we wouldn't be a human and it's okay. And it's just acknowledging them and pushing through them. And, you know, on the other side is growth. There was a quote I read before and it said, we're most equipped to, to coach the person we used to be. And so think about your team. You know, that was you. And, and perhaps there's days that, you know, we have an off day and we have to go back to our playbook and say, okay, how do we get, you know, our confidence up there? I think we're all, we're all in that same field, but because you recognize and you see in others, and that's what I feel is motivating you, inspiring you to say like, yeah, like I said, you're the younger me and I just want to blaze the trail so that we do the struggle and the, the, um, you know, the advancement to where I am doesn't have to be with so much friction. And, and some of that friction also is though within our own heads, like some of it is what we're creating. So that part, you know, we also have to work through. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've done a lot of that. You know, I've got, I think most people, we've got these automatic negative thoughts that, you know, we have to try and push away. And, um, but I think you're right, you know, just being able to see, I'll give you the story and I've sp- I've spoke to you already about my mother at the beginning of this, but my mother was um, a single mom in the eighties getting into it. And that was even more rare back then. Like if you can imagine me as a woman entering into the it field in the two thousands and already being um, a, a minority you can only imagine what it was in the eighties. Right. So like you said, the more you see other people doing this and you can say, I was you and just keep that chain going. It's only going to become more even. We're going to get to a point, hopefully, and I'm, I'm hopeful of this, where we do have a table that is large and is, has enough room for all of us there with all of our different perspectives, right? And so I, I'm huge in with my team. I, I have such a wonderful team. I really, really do. I'm so thankful for them. Um, but I, I love to be vulnerable with them, just like my mentors have been with me and let them know that, yeah, you're right. I was you and I was nervous and I kept on going. And I, I my team specifically, I know they they have so much uh, in them and so much potential and they will be the next uh, leaders. And I'm so proud to be part of that journey, really. That's amazing. Um and so here, I read a stat this morning, it said women make up less than 25% of the workforce in cybersecurity. And so with what you just said about you're hopeful to have a large, diverse group at the at the table, which, you know, I, I think we all are, um, what do you think we can do to, to start achieve, working towards achieving that, both from the female standpoint, but also, you know, this isn't to bash males. This is about how can we come together, educate, create, create awareness, even in the hiring, like what language are we using to attract the people? Even as you alluded to the beginning, the misconception, a lot of people think that you need all this. So how do you think, or, or what can we start doing to really inviting that number to start going up? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's dialogue. I think it's having the conversations. It's, um, it's strange. I had actually, funny enough, I had this conversation with my leader yesterday who happens to be a male. Um, but we were actually just having a conversation around how, um, in this industry and in cybersecurity and tech, you know, a man can say something, but if a woman says it at the same time, there's a different perspective and it just is what it is. And we all know this. Um, so understanding and continuing the dialogue that, um, if a male had said that, I think it's almost calling out those, those points, Mm -hmm. right? So in those moments, right. I think we need to understand and ensure that the dialogue is really out there, that we belong, that we have really good ideas and, and challenge. I am okay with challenging the status quo. I am okay with saying, why don't we have more female engineers? Why aren't we, like you said, in the hiring? Why in the hiring roles are we using words, like you mentioned, that are going to attract females into this industry? Are we having conversations at conferences that are letting women know what this industry is about? Like you said, non-technical. So I think there is so much work that we still need to do 
to help uh, bridge this gap. Some of the things that I do is I work with an organization called WESIS, which stands for Women in Cybersecurity. They do phenomenal work with um, mentorship. They do um, assistance with resumes, interview work, um, all of that. Um, So I personally do things like that. I also like to keep the dialogue going, like I've mentioned, um, at Blue Voyant, where I currently work, it it is such a wonderful place where we actually do something called Women of Blue Voyant. And we we like to amplify the women of Blue Voyant to show people that we've got some incredible women leaders here. And that helps um, for all the girls or women that are sitting there looking through LinkedIn and they're seeing, wow, but look, mm-hmm. look at all these women that they have that are in this industry. And we've got little blurbs um, that describe, you know, what what it is that's um, different about us and what's brought us to this field. So um, I, I think it's really, I would say, challenging the status quo. I would say dialogue, keeping the dialogue going. And um, and then it's really just mentorship and it's that hands on technical stuff that I can do. You know, I've I've got lots of um, students, women who are in computer science or looking to change careers and just anything that I can personally help them do, whether it's coaching, whether it's interview prep, um, et cetera, to help help bridge that gap and to help attract more into this field. Mm-hmm. Well, you're doing a, lo- a lot of great things, Amanda. So hopefully we, you know, those will start uh, increasing the numbers and, and just the awareness and, and this podcast as well, you know, getting people out there um, to see that, you know, it, it's a great career. It's a, you know, an evolving career. And, um, and that, you know, we need to be challenging the status quo and, and kudos to your leader for calling out, you know, the double standard, because I, I think, you know, we you know, creating that culture of, of what's acceptable and what's not, that that's, what's going to attract the right people. Right. And, um, and I think just when we're modeling the behavior, you, you know, you wean out a lot of people, you're disqualifying people that, you know, that don't see that, um, or don't align with that. They're, they're not going to attract them. So it sounds like you're not with that type of company, which is fantastic. And the, and the fact that they highlight and they share, you know, the woman of Blue Voyant, um, because I think, you know, when I was, you know, growing up in, in women in, in tech and women in sales, you know, I would look to uh, for mentors and I would see a table of white men. And I'm like, I don't see myself in any of these people. So imagine, as you mentioned, these young girls who are scrolling through LinkedIn and it's just, it's, there's nothing that resembles them. And the language is very technical language. It's you can see why they just keep scrolling. They're not going to stop for that. So, you know, congratulations on all you're doing, because I think when you bring, as you said, when we opened, you know, the intentionality and the purpose, I don't think anyone thinks of IT or cybersecurity in those regards, but you humanize it. And you said at the end of the day, this is somebody's um, personal information. They've been violated. And, and you don't see it that way. So when you can humanize it, you know, you're like, I, I want to help these people. I want to do right by that. And I think these younger generations coming in, you know, yeah, they want to be paid well, but they want to be part of something that's bigger, that's doing the right thing, you know? And, and it sounds like that that's the angle or the lens that you're coming at, you know, you, your, your history and career with cybersecurity. Yeah. Absolutely. Like I mentioned before, it is, um, I think that's part of one of the, the reasons why I've been so successful in this field is because it, it is a field that just means so much to me. Yeah. And, you know, how much would you say culture means to you? So to work for a company or be attracted to a company who challenges status quo, who empowers women, how, how enticing is that for you? absolutely enticing. That is where I want to be. That's the table that I want to sit at. Um, and I'm so lucky that I, I do have that where I am right now. It is a wonderful culture in that sense. I've been so blessed with wonderful leaders um, it, in this organization as well. And, and we do continue to do that. We challenge the status quo. Like I said, I've got a male leader who has these conversations with me who it, who doesn't um, accept that uh, within our organization. And it really, really has become um, part of our culture. And um, I, that, that is a huge part of my decision-making as to when I, when I made 
changes in my career. I've gone through different organizations, but really culture is one of them. And I want to work in an industry and I want to work for an organization that is going to value women's voices and that is going to challenge the status quo. So absolutely. And I'm so thankful that I, I work for an organization right now that, that we can do that. Mm -hmm. And do you think there are a lot like yours or do you think others foster other areas and perhaps not this? Um, I think there are others like my, my organization. I don't know that they, I don't believe they all are. I think there is, um, there are a lot of places where they don't foster that. Um, it, it, but this, this company definitely we do. And, um, it's important. And it's one of the reasons why I I've chosen to go there and be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's good. And hopefully, um, you know, you'll stay there because <laughs> they're doing some great things, which is good. Um, so I, I want to shift gears now, Amanda, and talk a little bit about, you know, you, you won this amazing award that it world Canada has, has issued and, you know, Leading up to this, you know, did you experience any of the any of these emotions of like, God, am I going to put my name in? You know, did you have any self talk? Did you have any of those imposter syndromes when you're applying for things like that? Did did you have kind of a resurgence of things you like? I thought I'm over these, but maybe they reappeared. Was there any of that? Absolutely. So it's actually a really funny story. Um, one of my colleagues had brought the award to my attention. And had said, did you know that there is this award? Award, And I'll be honest, I wasn't. I didn't know about it. Um, and there's the opportunity where you can do a self-nomination um, for these very important awards, or you can be not, you can nominate peers, colleagues, etc. So immediately I nominated one of my colleagues, somebody who I firmly believe she's phenomenal and she deserves to be in there. And I started to think about it in terms of myself and my brand and my career and what I want to accomplish. And I thought, well, it would be wonderful to be recognized as one of Canada's top women in cybersecurity. So I reached out to my network. And the funny thing is, when I reached out to my network, it was the last day of nominations. And I had sent out this note and um, I even prefaced it with... I don't think I'm going to win. However, I just want to kind of get my name in there. And it's when I look back now, I think, wow, here I was already disqualifying, disqualifying myself before I even got the opportunity to even enter into it. Um, so absolutely, I still struggle with those imposter syndrome and negative thoughts, but I kept pushing through. And I reached out to my network and thought, you know, if you believe that this is something that um, I'm, I deserve, do you mind putting in uh, a nomination for me? And Karen, one of the incredible things with this award, and I'm so honored that I was able to win it, was I was actually the highest nominated person. And not only the highest nominated, but by far, by far. And wow, when I had my interview with IT World Canada and they shared that with me, like, I, I couldn't believe it. Now, why did all of my colleagues nominate me? They, they didn't do it because they had to. They did it because they believed in me. I firmly believe that's why they had done it. And, and to get that reception, to have so many people that felt so passionate, that went out of their way to write what... They, why they believe that I deserve the nomination. I, I, I think that's just incredible. It goes to show that, you know, again, I, where I am in my career and, and all of the amazing things that I've been able to accomplish, none of it was by myself. It's always been um, through my mentors, my colleagues, the amazing people, the amazing relationships that I've made along the way. Um, but winning this award really, really showed me um, how important um, all of those little relationships you have, how important they really, really are. Um, but I completely had a little bit of imposter syndrome. Um, and even when I won it, oh my goodness, did I not um, have to read the email three or four times just to believe it. Um, it was a wonderful morning when I did. I had actually just spent two weeks in Italy I was logging back into work the Monday after a vacation thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to dig myself out of my mailbox. 
And here was this award sitting at the top of my mailbox waiting for me. And mm. um, if that wasn't motivation to get back into work, I don't know what is. Yeah. Um, it, it, the timing couldn't have been more wonderful. Um, but it, it really, truly was a gift. I, I'm so thankful to IT World Canada. I'm so thankful to all of my, um, for the people who believed in me and really um, give me that energy to want to keep going. And really all that does for me is want to make me give back. Like, how can I now give that back? Like, and, and again, the first thing that popped into my mind when I knew about the award was really, who can I nominate? I was so excited. Mm -hmm. And it was like, immediately, like, I need to, to, to highlight one of my team members. She's, she's phenomenal. She deserves this. Um, so yeah. Wow. What a, well, first of all, what a great way to come back from vacation. Cause yeah, I know those sea of red of emails. So, uh, that's fantastic. But think about, you know, your, how you're perceived by others when you had the most amount of nominations and you did it on the last day. I mean, Amanda, that's just a testament to you as a person, what you give back and even your altru altruistic nature in that your first inclination was to nominate somebody else. So you are others focused. And, and even when you, you started it is, you know, I'm probably not going to win. <laughs> well, be careful what you wish for because you did. Um, so that that's just so amazing. And I just think, you know, it comes, there's so many things there. A, it's a feedback loop that you, you know, what you're doing is right. That reciprocity loop in that as I grow, I take it back, but I, I, I don't do nothing with it. I'm continuing to give out, you know, to better myself, but also to bring others around. And, and I think what you said, energy, like that's part of the energy we give off. And, and that's what invited your network to say, yeah, like, uh, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I vote three times? You know? So just if you're ever, you know, doubting yourself or even saying like, maybe I'm not like, replay this and hear how people went to bat with for you without even thinking absolutely absolutely if that wasn't a lesson in don't disqualify yourself yeah. i don't know what it was so so now that you're the winner of this i mean do you go through your day a little different do you have a more you know controlled where where you have these thoughts or there's a bit of doubt you're like no i i'm the recipient of this like i'm past that has this kind of elevated you to be perhaps get in front of those thoughts, get in front of that imposter syndrome because you've been recognized at this, at this status. Yeah. So, and I, I really believe that yes, things have changed and this award really is a reminder and it is something that I'm going to use when I am in those moments, when I am questioning myself, I think part of that just is my nature and I'm always going to question myself a little bit. I think some of that is, is healthy. Um, but I, yeah, absolutely. I am going to use that award as something to remind me, you know, in those moments where I'm like, Hmm, I'm nervous. I don't know if I can do this. You know, I, I'm going to look back on that award and I'm going to remember that there were all these people who went to bat for you because they believe in you. So absolutely. I'm going to use it as a reminder, just like I do to any of my, my accomplishments. I really try and, um, use that, um, um, evidence versus, you know, my brain just telling me, well, my brain can tell me whatever it wants to tell me, but I know better. And I know that the evidence tells me otherwise. Right. So I, I do use um, the awards and all my accomplishments to help me in that sense. Mm -hmm. That's great. And you know, it's good that you you have such great self-awareness to recognize that, you know, you do go there. And, but you're able to kind of, you know, get past it. And now you have this recognition to say, you know, to, to help drive the thoughts and the behaviors you want, which is, which is great. Yeah. I absolutely, um, growing up as a, a young woman, I was the introverted, shy, typical little girl. Um, I didn't raise my hand a lot in class because I was often afraid that my answer would be wrong. And um, I've read a book called Brave Not Perfect. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Karen. It's by Reshma Sojani. And it resonated with me like nothing I've ever read before. And it just talked about women and 
how we are not raised to make mistakes and keep on going like like a typical boy is. Oh, get up, keep going, keep going. And I very much struggled with this. Don't do things unless you can do it perfectly. And um, I really have had to do this self-awareness and dig deep and understand all of that. And I've really started to use brave, not perfect as my mantra in life. And so again, like Mm -hmm. when I, when I sit back and I look at, I, I was aware of this award on the last day and I thought, Oh, I, you know, am I actually going to win? And, And that, that question, that moment, that's where I'm like, brave, not perfect. And that's my, when I switch into that gear and I can put my mantra into there and it's about, you know, be brave, get your name out there. What, what was the worst that can happen? You don't win. That's okay. Um, and so that's something that I've also really, really in the last few years spent a lot of time. I've actually even tattooed brave on my foot because for me, it was just such an important lesson, Amanda, stop worrying about being uh, perfect. It's okay because when you're brave and you put that one foot in front of the other, you know, you're, th- two things are going to happen. You're either going to succeed or you're going to fail. And when you fail, what does that really mean? Like if you can learn from that, you know, me being a project manager by nature, I'm always looking at lessons learned, right? So what lessons? Like failure actually isn't that bad of a thing, is it? Not always. You know, sometimes it can be. But there are so many other times where that lesson that you learned during that failure was so important that it's worth it. And so I I do spend a lot of time now and that's kind of become my mantra in life. Brave, not perfect. I, I, I tell that to my daughter. I tell that to anybody that I can just keep moving forward and, and it's okay to fail. And, you know, why not talk about our failures, but talk about them in the sense of, you know, this failed, but this is what I've learned in that moment. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's so great. When you were sharing that, I wrote down brave, not perfect. And I just thought that would make a great tattoo, but (laughs) you've already beat me to it. So good for you. you (laughs) We can have matching tattoos. Another bit of of evidence. Um, and, and think about for me, the word failure, I think people just get so triggered by the word failure and I love your, just the way you break it down and, um, especially in PM world, you know, it's all about the lesson learns, but it's not, if there's, if you've learned something from it, then it's not failure. It's, it's a feedback. And I think if you haven't failed, then you haven't tried. And so I would say inactivity is way worse than, than failing because failing at least, you know, it's okay. I started next time. I'm probably not going to go as far, right. I'm going to go a little bit this way and we'll see what that yields. But in the absence of that, we hold our punches and we do nothing. And I've done that. I've had situations where I, I was so afraid that I couldn't even, I was afraid of failing that I couldn't even put something together. And I remember one of my, my leaders at the time was like, just get it on paper and get it out. Get the first draft. And then it'll just come. And that's exactly it. It's like, okay, let's just put that one foot forward and that next foot forward and just keep going. And that's exactly it, right? And and you're right. Failure is such a trigger word, but is it really that bad, right? Is, or is it just that feedback loop? Is that, um, are you learning? Are you able to then get better the next time, right? And and like you said, you know, inactivity is worse. So I have two options. I could put my first draft out there and just get it out, or I could put nothing out there. And that's going to be much worse than that first draft that I'm going to put out, right? And so I've struggled with that quite a bit in my life. I've I've held back in early on in my career because I was just so afraid of it not being perfect. I was like, I can't do something unless it's 100%. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, part of that is is just me um, wanting to do good things. But I've realized that it wanting the wanting to do it so well, like you said, can can have a negative aspect to it and it can hold you back. And it has. And I've that's something that I no longer do. I am one foot in front of the other. I'm going to remind myself every day to be brave and uh, to, to start start with something, start put something out there, whatever it may be. It, it can be many different things. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And, and I think perfection is just, you know, it's a complete letdown and you're striving for disappointment and it's, it's unachievable. Right. So I think the quicker we can all, um, you know, agree with that, the, the quicker we can move forward. But think about what you said there, Amanda, about just starting and you're talking about a draft. And imagine younger Amanda or someone now listening who is entering into the field of IT and they're the one out of 17 women in the room and they have an idea, but the group is talking and they're like, I want, I want to say it. I want to say it. And, and so they're holding back because the way they have thought about it or phrased it might not be perfect. And so they're going through this meeting the whole time and their voice isn't being heard. And, you know, you're saying you want every, every woman to be at the table. So what, what would you say to those young women at the table now that are saying, like, I just want to say something, but I'm afraid. And so how can we invite them to let go of that and just say your, your words are worthy, you belong here? So I think it's two parts. So I think it's reminding, um, so working with women and telling them that. Um, but I think also it comes in those situations where we are in larger groups. I can relate to those women so much. I can also relate to it from a perspective where just being the shyer one, I'm never going to be the loudest person in a room. It's just not my personality. And that was also something that I was very nervous about because I was in rooms with people who were type A personalities. They were loud and the louder voices were being heard. And what I've realized is in those rooms, when I'm in those rooms, I like to hear the people, all of the people, not just the loudest voices, right? So For me as a leader, what I do in those situations is I try and encourage all the different voices. I try and encourage everyone to collaborate, invite. I I try and ensure that everybody feels comfortable um, sharing what they what they want to share, because I believe it's valuable. Um, So when I am in those situations and in those rooms, yeah, I definitely um, offer people, invite people to share their their messages Um, But I would say to those women who are in those rooms, you got to exactly that brave, not perfect. Right. Um, I, I will say those, those men, those loud voices aren't as concerned about being perfect. I think some people, they could just speak. It just comes naturally. And and they, they're, they're not, um, they don't have that same nervousness behind them. That's holding them back. Um, So I would just say, don't worry about perfection. Get your voice out there. Take, use, dig deep, put that one foot in front of the other. And I think the more you do it, like, like I said, like get that first draft out. And the more you do it, you actually start becoming more comfortable, right? So the first time you do it, the first time I spoke in that meeting room, I, I, my face was red. I was sweating. I was super nervous, but I did it. And I did it yeah. and I did it again and I kept on doing it. And just like anything you do, the more you do it, it's just going to become easier. So I would say, remind yourself that you belong there. I would say, take the leap, lean in, open, say it loud and it's okay. Your voice may quiver. Mine was quivering too. Um, mm-hmm. But really just take that step and lean in and really um, break outside of your comfort zone, right? And then I also encourage um, people to listen to all people in a meeting. You know, we've all been to meetings where there's maybe three or four people that are, you know, running the majority of the dialogue in the conversation. And it really is trying to invite the quieter folks, maybe not the type Mm -hmm. A personalities into the conversation and trying to understand what their perspective is. Yeah. I think that's so valuable, Amanda, just leaning in and really, you know, as you said, in time, it's going to be less uncomfortable. But, you know, for those who are not afraid in the type A's and, you know, a lot of times they control the meeting and they're, you know, pushing the other ones further into their shell. And, you know, oftentimes what they're saying also isn't the most (laughs) brightest idea in the world. They just like to hear themselves talk. So I think it's incumbent upon the leader to, to just really control the meeting and, and invite and invite everyone in. And that's really creating a safe space to keep the loud people, you know, at, at bay, but, but invite the others because the longer we kind of say nothing, there's going to be no change. We're not, we're, we're, um, we're continuing status quo. We're not challenging exactly. it. Exactly. How do you talk to your daughter about 
brave, not perfect, about confidence, about these things. Is it, is it part of your dialogue? Is it like, what, what kind of things do you do to foster that in her? Absolutely. So I am a, I love seeing little girls and it's funny because um, my daughter is actually nothing like me. She is actually not an introvert. She isn't, doesn't have a shy bone in her body, but that doesn't mean that she's not going to have, you know, insecurities within her that may start get, getting a little bit loud. So um, I definitely have a lot of conversations with her about brave, not perfect. Um, in our home, we've also even changed the wording of um, practice makes perfect. I've never liked that. Um, and so the words that we use in our house is practice makes progress. And I keep telling her because we don't need to be perfect. It's okay to fail. Failure is okay. Be brave, not perfect. Um, so I do a lot of that with her. I do make sure with her that um, she she is brave and continues to challenge and and go outside of the box. Um, thankfully, naturally, she just has that. She's such a determined little girl. Um, but I but I still think even those ones where you may not think that they have some insecurities, they probably do. Mm -hmm. So um, we do a lot of talking like that. Um, we also do a lot of we do a lot of yoga and meditation in our home as well. And actually in our home, we actually even have a yoga studio. And right on the wall of our yoga studio, we have a lot of positive affirmations. And right big smack in the center is Brave Not Perfect. It talks about, you know, practice makes progress. I've seen her in situations where she is so overwhelmed with the thought of trying to get over a mountain. And I do a lot of let's just take the steps. We don't need to worry about getting over the mountain. We're, today, we just need to get about a quarter of the way of, up the mountain. So how can we just take a couple of steps to start making our progress there? We don't have to be there today. Maybe we just have to be halfway there. So I do try and break things down a little bit to her and try and make it, um, let her know that you don't have to climb the mountain in a day. You know, are you making progress? Are you better than you were yesterday? Mm -hmm. Are you challenging, you know, thoughts that are holding you back? Are you striving to be the best that you want to be? That's, that's what I want to instill in her, both her and my son. I really want to instill all of that in them. Mm -hmm. And I, and I want them to know that, you know, mistakes and failures and all that, that I'm going to be there. I'm going to support them. And we're going to celebrate even some of those failures because some of them are going to be your biggest learning lessons mm -hmm. in your life. Yeah. That's so beautiful. And you are a great mom and your kids are lucky to, to have you as their mom. Um, but I, I think it's so important to celebrate failures um, because it makes it safe and it allows them to continue to try. And um, I have a coaching client and she says the, the F word. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I know what the F word is. And she said failure. And I just, I, and, and so when you have a relationship with, with it like that, I just think your reluctance to try things is, is you know, in the, in the negatives. But I, I think when you can almost accept it's part of the journey, I will 100% fail. I, I'm not perfect. So the minute you can acknowledge that, there's going to be degrees of failure. It might be, you know, I wanted 70%, I got 65%. That, that's still not achieving what I want. But I know now what I should be doing differently for next time. So I'm like, thank you. Oh my gosh, I'm going to take this back. I'm going to rework it. I'm going to put it out there. So I think it's also our relationship with failure. And if we see it as this big, you know, red beacon of, of nastiness, we're not going to go near. We're not going to try. We're not going to be creative or curious. So it's great that you're fostering that with your children of just, you know, let's try. Let's celebrate our failures because it's feedback. It's showing us that, you know what, we were on the right track a little bit tweak this way. And that's what they are tweaks. Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly it. it it's that pro, um, progress. Like, mm -hmm. can you tweak it? Can you do a little bit? Can you get a little bit closer? And then the next time, what's, what's that gap? What's that Delta that you need to find? Mm -hmm. Right. It's just that, that keep on going. It's that, that grit, um, yeah. that determination. 
And so when you're working with your daughter, do you think there's some areas that you're also benefiting yourself from as you're having these conversations? Is there a little bit that's that feedback going back to, okay, this is a little good reminder for me too? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm okay with that. I love, you know, it's a journey that we're on together. I'm learning, she's learning. I don't know it all. Um, I'm never going to be the perfect mom, but absolutely. It's a little bit of this feedback loop and everything that I am saying to her, I'm reminding myself just as much. I Mm -hmm. absolutely am. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to write brave, not perfect on my board now because I do love it. And, uh, we definitely don't strive for perfection because it's just, you know, the, the best we can all do. And that's all, if you've given it your best, (laughs) I can't ask for any more than that. Right. Exactly. Um, so we've talked about many things, Amanda, and I want to thank you for your time and just sharing, you know, your journey, um, some of your struggles, but also leaning into that discomfort and and really, you know, seeing the growth and obviously the recognition from IT World Canada on the other side that, you know, you've, you've, you've won this, this amazing award. So it just really is an affirmation for those who are saying, well, you know what, it's, it's never going to happen for me, or it's it's too much work that it is possible. And, you know, you were down to the wire. You had one day and you had the most nominations. So even maybe when you're doubting yourself, it's that external, your team and your network are going to bring you across the line. And because of what you've given and what you've done for them in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So, so if anybody would like to connect with you, perhaps learn a little bit more about you, what are, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm Amanda Vicinanzo, Amanda Vicinanzo on LinkedIn. You can find me there. I'm also on Instagram, mindful.avici. Um, I do a lot of my yoga posting there as well because I'm a yogi as well. Um, so I, I'm always open. I would love to connect with people. I often do uh, connect via LinkedIn and help um, women who are looking to get into the field, women and men looking to get into the field. Um, so if there's anything that I can do to help any one of your listeners, I am, I would be glad to, uh, to assist. Well, that's amazing. We'll include all that in the show notes. So again, uh, thank you so much for your time and sharing your wonderful story, Amanda. We're, we're better off for it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Such an honor to be here today. My pleasure. And thank you all for listening and we'll see you next time.